Hello, dear colleagues and listeners. Welcome to our panel discussion on uh, the future of skills domain knowledge with technology. We are here to talk about how skills related to artificial intelligence AI are changing the job market. Our panelists, uh, my colleagues uh, from one company, data art, but different areas and uh, bring unique perspectives. We will discuss what skills will be most important for future job candidates, uh, the role of specialized degrees, and how humans fit into the world of AI, co-pilots, and uh, generative AI tools. Mm -hmm. We are also explore what kind of candidates companies are looking for. And let me introduce our panelists, my colleagues, uh, Marina Melnik, Head of Learning and Development. Hi, Marina. Hello, uh, hi, Tatiana, hi, hi, hi. Uh, Tatiana Hapachila, in charge of workforce and resource management at DataArt. Hi, Tatiana. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi. Greg Kravatz, uh, VP of Precision Medicine and AI Solutions in Healthcare and Life Sciences. And uh, hi, Greg. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello. And me, Andrei Kedrov, uh, delivery manager with expertise in uh, educational technology in EdTech. Together, we will dive into the skills that will define the future of work and uh, bridging you know, the gap between expertise in specific fields and technology in the era of Gen AI. Uh, how do you feel, colleagues? Are you comfortable? Can we get started? Absolutely. I just demonstrated that I am not the AI, not artificial intelligence, but a human being. Yeah, <laughs> uh, demonstrating, you know, just some uh, empathy, and uh, and I really just interested in how are you guys. So, uh, you know, just we we have a couple of main topics, and uh, let's get started from the first one. Uh, I think this will be interesting. Uh, not only to us, uh, panelists, I don't like this name, but okay, uh, colleagues. And uh, uh, the topic is the changing landscape of job requirements. And uh, my first question here is how generative AI related skills are right now redefining candidate qualifications in the job market? And uh, interesting question, I, I, I think uh, maybe Tatiana, you can just start this first discussion. You will be the first one. And yeah, uh, you know, just let's decide uh, uh, that everybody, including also me, we can add some comments and also some, some ideas uh, to the conversation. But let's uh, first speaker just, uh, let's wait to, to, to end the, uh, the conversation. Uh, Tatiana, just the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Andre. Uh, now I can say that Gen AI is really a hot topic. And from staffing perspective and resource manager perspective, I can say that during last year when ChatGPT was launched, we feel a lot of requests from our clients from different type of domain and businesses regarding how generative AI can improve their business, in which area they can make this automation, boost uh, uh, efficiency, boost uh, creativity of the AI team. And uh, due to that, uh, in case if you are talking about candidate market and workforce market, uh, I want to divide maybe um, it to a uh, few parts. First of all, uh, we uh, very often uh, re receive requests regarding AI specialists, uh, uh, regarding developers who work with large uh, language models, who can help uh, identify existing problems, and who can uh, build uh, uh, data and work with huge amount of data. And Currently, I think that it's really important to keep in mind that we have a limited market of such resources and it's a good opportunity for our uh, colleagues and for our um, uh, software developers that it's really nice chance to expand their technical knowledge and to learn uh, something new regarding um, um, artificial intelligence related. 
also in case if we are talking about some decisions that we want to uh, make uh, regarding changes in our business processes uh, the really uh, high importance i see in a uh, domain expert uh, because only these people can uh, understand process uh, in their domain, in their companies uh, in the best way I can, and can find the part of processes and tools in which a company can uh, use um, generative AI and in which area they will have the biggest profit. Due to that, I see... Um, in, I, I also want to highlight the importance for such domain expert to understand how generative AI works. And due to that, uh, it's really, uh, uh, I see a huge need to uh, maybe for companies to um, uh, have AI strategy regarding education. And also it's easily to find maybe some online uh, resources mm -hmm. to receive uh, in more information how generative AI can uh, change our type of work and how we can switch from maybe maybe rep repetitive task, work with huge data and uh, a lot uh, of routine task, maybe to more creative job and have more space for improvements. Uh, also, uh, it's crucial to talk about soft skills because uh, now we're just in the start of gen generative AI era okay. and all, all of our colleagues and all of us should, see, should think, do we flexible enough? Are we ready to uh, maybe open door for changes in our daily routine? And uh, uh, do we... Um, uh, and uh, it's really important to also highlight maybe importance of professional ethics that uh, can with which can help domain experts and uh, some biases mitigation. It's really important too. And uh, summarizing uh, all this information, I want to say that it's really important to uh, cover a technical topic, to uh, uh, expand talent pool of AI engineers and developers who can build a different type of uh, Gen AI models. Also, uh, it's very important to provide education for domain experts and to people who have existing skills and perform tasks in different domains and also work uh, work with soft skills who can help to implement different models in our daily routine, improve this model and provide feedbacks to technical experts. Wow. Uh, thank you, Tatiana, for, uh, for this uh, answer. But then you several times mentioned uh, the soft skills. And it's interesting because the soft skills, it's, they was extremely uh, valuable also just before this uh, AI era and uh, right now. But what exact soft skills do you mind when you're saying that, okay, that soft skills and some technical proficiency is needed for, for the candidates? Could you name a couple of them? Uh, yes, sure. Special, maybe say... some special. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, as I mentioned previously, flexibility is crucial right now. Uh, teamwork, collaboration, open-minded candidates will be uh, really uh, uh, important in such uh, maybe tremendous era of changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I see Marina is smiling. Maybe you have also some uh, something to add here. I actually, I can echo to what uh, Tatiana has just said, because, uh, for instance, I just read, um, you know, lots of like big companies, consulting companies uh, conduct various types of research, including the future of jobs, the future of skills and so on. Mm -hmm. So the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum um, released a report, the future of jobs in May this year. Mm -hmm. And in May, so basically it was after the chat GTP disrupted the whole world, oh. right? What do you think the top five uh, core skills wow. employers indicated? Uh, that's um, interesting. And, yeah, 
And there were 800 companies surveyed uh -huh. across the globe from different, uh, from dozens of different industries of various size and so on. Top five um, core skills, according to them, um, the important for them, for employers is number one, analytical thinking. Number uh -huh. two, creative thinking. Number three, resilience, flexibility, and agility. That's uh -huh. what Tatiana has just said. Number four, motivation and self-awareness. And number uh -huh. five, curiosity and lifelong yes. learning. Um, I, I don't want to, oh. like, you know, to take too much time uh, here. Of course, there are like different uh, industries have their own specific top, top skills. But other than that, like IT, right, industry, uh, our top uh, important skill would be technology skills. But other mm -hmm. than that, these are the skills that employers indicate as very important for them, employers. So thank you, Marina. Does it mean, mean that we as a data art will start just in the near future to start looking for creative, I don't know, QA engineers? Uh, and how can we measure, you know, this creativity and, uh, and, and curiosity also? Yeah? Because uh, as you mentioned before, uh, these skills are uh, mandatory right now and, and, uh, uh, and companies are looking for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Greg, you also can add uh, if, you, if you have your opinion also. I can just jump in. Yeah. Let's, let's go back to the definition of creativity. It may sound like totally unrelated to what we do, but what is creativity? It's um, finding solutions, uh, uncommon solutions, unconventional mm -hmm. to conventional problems. So creativity is actually, you may not even think about it, but it in everybody's actually job even like uh, technical professionals jobs, even like QA engineers as well. They look for different ways of uh, testing, of solving problems and so on. Yes, yes. Thank you. I just uh, right now thinking about- Also you know, from my side, the... I- Oh, sorry, yeah. Yes, I, as I, I want to add that in case if you're talking about uh, creativity in our daily work, it's maybe very often we are talking about the attitude, how we perform oh. our task, just not only do some repetitive things, but try to find some new solutions, some new options, how we can do maybe the same task, but in another way. Okay, thank you. I'm just, you know, after that, I'm starting to think not only about uh, IT, but also in general, uh, imagine this situation. We are looking for creative accountant for, for the company. Just it, that was a joke. Yeah. Greg, do you have something to add here? Well, yes. Thank you, Andres. My, my background, by the way, is uh, 20 years in, in clinical research, optimization for customers. So uh, helping them move experimental drugs uh, through their clinical trials to FDA approval to bring them to market for uh, to better patients' lives around the globe. And prior to that, I was actually a technical recruiter. So I think what we're seeing in the market is that the basics that employers always looked for are still there. Uh, soft skills or Communication skills are, are very important. The ability to interact with other human beings and communicate complex uh, topics is very important. Technical skills, of course, come into play. Every employer wants to hire someone who has experience with the technical uh, technology that they're used to working with. Uh, they've made the mistakes before, and so they, uh, they prefer someone who is seasoned there. And then domain, <clears throat> domain knowledge has always been important as as an add-on um, in that <clears throat> if I'm building an order entry system, I, I'd highly prefer someone who has order entry or has finance skills or has the skills in my, uh, in my particular industry. What we're seeing in, uh, in my world of clinical research, there's a movement towards precision medicine. And what that means is we're going from treating an uh, a, a group of people to designing drugs and treatments for individuals. Mm -hmm. And what that brings into play is uh, massive data sets and massive complexity within those data sets. 
Um, and starting about 10 years ago, um, I saw this in a company I was working for where there was a movement in clinical research from handling just simple sort of uh, data, someone's blood pressure or someone's heart rate or a simple lab test to analyzing their genomic profile or their proteomic profile or, or massive uh, lab tests. And at that point, the industry was hiring people. There were no people that had the expertise in these massive genomic data sets. So the industry was hiring people who came out of similar industries with this uh, with these massive data sets, namely insurance. Insurance had these massive data sets that they were handling in the claims information. So there was, uh, there was specific hiring that went on with people with that experience. But as these industries uh, mature, again, we're starting to see there's a requirement for specific domain knowledge. And uh, in, in my industry, that domain knowledge is starting to become medical and scientific. And so there's a melding of this standardized clinical data to the, the scientific data that is requiring someone to have potentially the, that background where understanding human biology is a very complex endeavor relative to understanding the complexities of an, of an order entry system. So that is coming into play within, within my industry. And not to say that the individual skills are so important, but for those people who are having or uh, desiring to rise into leadership, having that domain expertise is becoming more and more important as they move forward and make decisions that AI is driving into their laps. You know, they're, cool. we're able to summarize this massive data now, but there's still uh, the requirement to lead these teams down the proper paths and move these projects forward in an efficient manner. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. And um, I have the next question to, to all of us. And um, remember the times when, the, you know, this proficiency in, in Microsoft Word and Excel was uh, just mandatory, <laughs> just uh, for job applicants. Yeah? And uh, my question here, uh, well, first of all, uh, can we just identify the nowadays skill set that right now is considered as fundamental, like this knowing of Word and, and Excel? And uh, the, the second part of this question, just complex question, is uh, is the skill of quick and constant learning uh, a new black right now? So what is this fundamental skill set? And uh, uh, we, we also mentioned that uh, Tatiana and Marina, this lifelong learning is uh, very important right now. What is a new black right now? I also have something to say, but maybe after Marina, after you. Uh, yeah, I think that Surprisingly, as the head of all India, so I guess there is no surprise that I will say that um, scale to quick and constant learn is a new black, but I wouldn't actually call it a new black um, because it has always been there for like years and years. This is something employers look uh, for in their candidates, in their employees again. And this is backed up with quite a lot of uh, research and data. And um, why? There are a few other numbers uh, that I uh, like uh, referring to when we talk about it is that uh, lots of uh, companies, uh, they realize and they share it explicitly that uh, within a five-year time frame, almost half of the core skills of the employees will change dramatically. And we oh. all know that. And in average, there is another um, uh, impressive number that talent development specialists uh, like referring to in such conversations is an average lifespan of a skill, which is okay. from three to five years. Just um, think, everyone, think uh, about yourselves in your current roles and positions and think uh, how your role and skills, required skills, looked like five years ago 
and how they look now. I'm sure like the majority will say, yes, they are different. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, digital skills change even faster than human skills, as we call them. Again, there is lots of research about that. For instance, I remember recent Coursera research. They released it this year, a few months ago, I think. And they admit that um, the fastest growing, like uh, digital, um, the fastest growing digital skills are changing more significantly that, than fastest growing human skills. Well, what does it mean? For instance, uh, if we look at the data, what kind of courses, digital courses, they learners take took last year and this year, uh, there will be only top 10 courses, let's say. There will be only 10, they will be out of 10, there will be only two um, duplications considering, like comparing with the previous year. Uh, if I remember it correct, the data visualization and uh, and user experience. And that's it. So that's how fast demand for digital skills changes uh, so for soft skills as well. And that's why I, I truly believe that uh, the new black that's always been there is the skill to continuously learn and develop. As commonplace as it sounds, but that's how it is. Cool. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah to survive yeah. in a fast-paced world. Yeah. <laughs> I think that you know Microsoft with their announcement of ChatGPT really did the did us a favor in that they they're making AI available to the masses. They're democratizing yeah. AI, and what comes with lifelong learning is really curiosity and passion. And I've got this sign over my shoulder about passion and. What I've seen in my career, the people that move forward and get promoted are curious and they're passionate about the work that they're doing. There is so much knowledge to obtain now that as you're as you're doing projects in the in the in the real world in your job, you really don't have as much time to learn about the future and what's coming at you. And so that if you're curious and passionate and you're interested in your dim, dim domain, your specific domain, you tend to take in that knowledge from wherever that is. It could be talking to someone at a party. It could be a, a reading an article on an airplane. And so that really is uh, what lifelong knowledge is about, this, this ongoing curiosity. And we happen to be in the field where we're helping improve, improve patients' lives or uh, even clients' lives or customers' lives by enabling AI and enabling them to do their jobs quicker and more efficiently with uh, you know, a less mon mundane aspect. So th that passion to learning is, is, I think, where the successful people are, are, are gathered around today. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you for your valuable addition. Just some small uh, from my side also. Uh, you know, just I asked Chad GPT. Uh, if uh, ability or of uh, to learn quick uh, quickly is uh, a new black, just in two different ways, and uh, I I will read right now two different answers for you. So that's for number one, just Chat GPT AI. Um, this ability to learn quickly, often referred to as continuous learning or lifelong learning, is not necessarily a new black. Uh, answer number one. Answer number two. Yes, the skill of quick and constant learning can be considered the new black in the context of fundamental skills. So my opinion is that the new black right now in today, and imagine that we have all information, a lot of information, a lot of all the answers uh, under our fingers. And uh, I think personally that the new black is ability to ask correct questions. <laughs> we have a lot of knowledge around, not only Google, but also for Google in Google era. It also was just, uh, if you ask, you, you get it, but this, artificial intelligence right now it it provides the answer that according to how we ask him her or it i don't know how to name right now it 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And um, let's move to to another question. The next one is uh, maybe I, I think uh, maybe the question. This will be more for to you, Greg. Uh, does previous experience of work in some specific industry influence the smooth adaptation to a new job? What do you prefer to see as an advantage on boarding from scratch for a fresh specialist or being a colleague who has some old habits in specific industry? For example, med tech. Yeah, and I think I, I spoke about this briefly before. Um, there is, uh, Tatiana mentioned this earlier, there is certainly some skills required today that are very rare skills in the market as the, as the market explodes. So uh, employers are willing to take on someone that has similar experience in, in not their industry that can be applied. As I mentioned earlier, sort of the massive data sets and in insurance uh, were uh, the experience that can be applied to genomic data sets. So you know, specific industry experience uh, can be helpful, assuming that there are not candidates in uh, in the industry that have that that skill set because it, it's new in the industry. You might see it in search engine optimization companies nowadays, where it hasn't been around that long that there are people with uh, you know those specific skills out there in a specific industry that they're willing to bring on board and train. Uh, people. Um, if you're looking for a change mid-career into a leadership role, that would be certainly more difficult to move out of your industry or an employer would be less likely to hire you into an industry that you're not, you don't have the expertise in mid-career. But certainly I think we're seeing early on in people's career, they do have that flexibility within the first the first few years uh, to uh, to apply uh, industry experience into uh, and, and, and enable that so that they uh, they can get a position in a company that, that that may be in a separate industry, but is looking for some of their specific skills that they acquired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, maybe question to all of us. Uh, what do you think will just in perspective of the next three, five years, uh, will AI replace some traditional, well, let, let's say, IT roles or IT uh, uh, professions uh, completely? Well, for example, I don't know, uh, AI, some tools, uh, some frameworks, some uh, interesting solutions completely could uh, replace for example, QA manual engineers. What are your thoughts regarding this? Maybe we can all contribute here. Uh, maybe from a resource management perspective, I can command okay. that uh, currently, <laughs> currently uh, it's difficult to predict such uh, a yeah. huge, uh, such, uh, uh, such maybe it's really uh, hard to talk about such future. But on the other hand, uh, if we are um, talking about right now, I think Jen, I can cover some part of our works, but not everything. And due to that, I think it would be better for us to consider different uh, Jen and I models in our daily work as a great assistant who can help us with some part of automation mm -hmm. but uh currently if we are talking about different level of software engineers or testers i th i i can say that for uh, senior level colleagues it's really difficult to replace such a person because it's about expertise not only about uh, technical skills but decision making domain understanding leadership on the other hand in case if we're talking about junior colleagues they don't have enough knowledge just to have their maybe expert opinion regarding maybe some solutions then jen and i can suggest and uh, validate mm -hmm this solution potentially could be difficult. But in case if you're talking right now, I think some part it's possible to replace, but not 
everything and not huge amount of uh, job <laughs> responsibility. I hope that we can consider GNI and I like a bridge to next level of automation, but not a replacement mm -hmm. of the humans at all. Thank you. Um, Marina, Greg, do you have your own opinion? Yeah, I think we've seen this throughout history in the IT industry, the uh, programmers becoming more productive. If, if we look back to the, the, the first programmers were doing assembler language coding at the machine level, mm -hmm. and then we came out with the third generation languages, the COBOLs and the Fortrans of the world, which made that process more efficient. And then uh, we moved to the four GLs of the world, uh, SQL, uh, which made, again, people more efficient in, in um, unearthing data and reporting. And I think this is, this is just another evolution uh, along that step that it's, it's making the people in our IT communities more efficient. And what that does, it, it actually brings the cost down for enabling further applications uh, across the board for corporations or uh, medical centers. And so uh, while the skills may be changing, I think that the demand for resources will continue as it has been in the IT industry since, since the dawn of the, the IT industry. Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, I Other can just, opinions? Yeah, in, interesting. Now, just uh, in addition, I totally agree with Tatiana. We cannot really, we can't pretend, we can predict, but we cannot really. No one knows what's going to happen, right, exactly mm -hmm. in, in a few years. Uh, what we can say for sure now is that some reskilling of... Uh, technical specialists will be needed, right? For instance, reskilling of uh, software developers uh, who might work with uh, AI co-pilots. And so mm -hmm. they, their skills will be different, right? Like you said, skill number one, it, it's zero step to give correct uh, prompt instruction, instructions to AI, then get the response. And skill number two, analytical thinking, right? To analyze what you got from AI and make decisions. So this is risk killing. Uh, mm -hmm. Speaking about uh, replacing, again, we don't know, but uh, from like various research I read, um, which made me really happy. Uh, around 50% oh. uh, of surveyed companies, they see that AI will actually add jobs uh, oh. to the market and only 25% uh, of companies uh, think that it will cause job losses. So the outlook is quite optimistic. We're not talking about replacing, we're talking about reskilling and uh, enhancing uh, performance of various specialists. And probably, by the way, the appearance of new AI uh, specializations roles. Uh, thank you, colleagues. On, on this optimistic note, uh... I would like just to switch to another to another topic, and uh, yeah, who knows uh, what will be in the future? But I suggest having uh, the maybe in, in two three years, maybe just return to this topic and uh, in this uh, date art IT nonstop format and discuss you know all the change that was during this period. But the next, uh, the next big topic is the need of domain-specific degrees just right now. Yeah. And uh, my question is, uh, do engineers and uh, other AI professionals in uh, specific domains, such as medicine, biology, aviation, uh, benefit from having additional relevant degrees? And what are the advantages and disadvantages uh, of such as uh, educational path? No, maybe Tatiana, Greg, you can comment here. Additional degrees for engineers and AI professionals. Uh, again, again, certainly we've seen in the IT industry the the requirement for de for de degrees is, is not absolute. You know, we we've uh -huh. seen Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg did not graduate <laughs> from college, and yet they they formed these these global companies. Um, 
I saw uh, an old video of Steve Jobs the other day describing that the best programmers are 100 times more productive than the average programmers. And so there is, uh, there is a certain talent that some people can have in the industry that puts them further ahead without the degrees. But certainly, uh, we're seeing uh, degrees becoming more important at the start of people's career. Uh, certainly, the things that uh, people learn in data with data science degrees in college now is very pragmatic in terms of their application in the job market. Uh, versus, you know, other degrees that may have not been that applicable applicable in the in the past. Uh, in my area, certainly, uh, people with the, the medical degrees or specializing in genomics uh, is getting them ahead of the game. Certainly, to uh, to move on the fast track to move up into the uh, into these organizations. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're if you're looking to get into leadership. Um, Having these degrees, these advanced degrees in these scientific or these complex endeavors is certainly very important in their careers. Thank you, Greg. Uh, cool. Tatiana, do you have something to add? I can add that for regulated industries, degree uh, could be really beneficial, as Greg mentioned, for healthcare, for financial uh, domain, for insurance. Potentially, it could it could provide good fundamental knowledge and to maybe make uh, uh, artificial intelligence specialist maybe uh, more expert in problem solving in specific domain and uh, provide uh, uh, him or her uh, deep domain knowledge. On the other hand, I think that uh, in case if we are talking um, about situation when a software engineer needs to have this additional degree and need to spend some additional time and cost, I don't think that it's a really good idea because it's um, need some time and money and in this case you need to put on pause your current career and also uh, if you're talking about knowledge uh, then you can receive uh, after education we can uh, say that currently uh, knowledge can become outdated very fast and also mm -hmm. as Greg man, uh, mentioned too I think now it's really important to compare. Do we need degree or do we need real experience? Uh, due to that, I think it would be really helpful maybe to pass some short-term courses or maybe have a good connection and teamwork with domain expert who can provide enough information to uh, maybe uh, creation a great solution in case if we're talking about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and the next question is related to, I, I think so, it's related also to this question because it's just, uh, how does domain-specific education correlate with data verification and validation in the context of AI? Well, just in cases where businesses, you know, rely on data obtained with AI, who should assume responsibility for that task of data validation? Yeah, and, uh, and and you also mentioned that uh, just educate some technical specialist, data engineer to be, you know, uh, to know, uh, to have a deep knowledge of, uh, of this domain is uh, it, it's time and cost and how to, who will do this job right now, maybe in the future. Can you, can you share maybe some, some uh, thoughts that you have. Uh, I, I also have prepared just my vision here. Uh, who, who wants to be the first one? Okay, let it be me. <laughs> okay, so just for, first question, very quick answers. Uh, how does domain-specific education correlate? It correlates, yeah, it, it, it correlates. And the second is, uh, who should take this responsibility? My, my, I believe that uh, still human, human being. And I will start to, uh, by answering the, the second part of this question. Uh, right now, uh, we have several cases uh, where some Gen AI, 
provide, you know, just generate some information, some data, and another AI just, you know, it's taking the, and, uh, um, and validate this data. In fact, personally me, I don't want to live in, 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 in that world when uh, only AI validates everything. For example, my wife is, uh, she's in medicine, she's a radiologist, and I know that some AI um, are uh, just working right now, you know, just checking this, all these uh, pictures and, and so on, providing some results. And uh, really, my, my wife is... Uh, absolutely scared about her future and we we had a long discussion with her uh, regarding uh, i asked her okay uh, who is validating this data she answered i don't know it was pre-validated and my question was okay hey, if you see yeah it was pre you know it's some kind of black box uh something happening here they got some response, they see this answer to, to, to the patient, and they can, in fact, they can change something according to, to the knowledge they have, she, she has. But my question was, okay, when you see some discrepancies or just some not correct results provided by AI, do you inform somebody on that? Your answer was, not, I don't need to do it. So my answer is that uh, that is, is absolutely not correct. So together, the main expert, as an example, my wife, she's the main expert, and some black box AI, but some data engineers, data scientists who has created this solution, they have to have, you know, communication because of absolutely unpredictable, sometimes unpredictable results that, uh, especially in healthcare, I would say it's, uh, it's very risky. Greg, can you comment here? Yes, and, and I think, you, I think, you, and I think you use some, some, some great examples. You know, certain radiology and reading images is a complex task, and uh, there's times that it's validated between, you know, reading a complex uh, tumor type may be done between two radiologists and then comparing their notes as to what do you, what do you see out there? Uh, and data validation is really the name of the game, certainly in the medical industry, because if the data is not valid in the medical industry, you can affect the health of people. Oh. If the data is not valid in some of our under, other industries, you, you may not be affecting people, but you'll be affecting the revenue of companies and, and the decisions exactly. they make. Uh, in the medical industry, really the, the method to data validation uh, is really scientific peer-reviewed articles. And that's really where the frontiers of medical research have been validated over time. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the view of the data coming out of a black box is really a problematic uh, uh, aspect of the uptake of AI. If people can't understand the formula that goes on behind the scenes and it's coming out of a black box, they're certainly not going to trust what it's advising or what it's telling you. And so the way to enable the trust of that is uh, peer reviewed data out there. And I suspect other industries as AI becomes more prevalent and affecting the lives of, of people or revenue, will essentially have to go to those types of formats that uh, the experts in the industry are reviewing the results of this algorithm to say, uh, you know, this is, uh, this does map back to the quote unquote ground truth out there that could have been derived by 20 human beings over 10 hours time, perhaps. Um, so that, I think it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, trusting what AI is telling you is really the, the key to its its uptake in the future. Yeah, I, I'd like to add uh, a bit sure. like additional perspective. Uh, again, uh, an excellent uh, case, uh, Andre, um, with your wife. And I think we all are learning to live in this new reality for us. Uh, we're all exploring 
that's why there are no processes, no validation, you know, step so far yet, yet. Uh, I think um, we as human beings tend to be more reactive than proactive. And uh, by saying this, I mean that until something bad happens, uh, then we will introduce uh, serious policies, guidelines, uh, zillions of additional checks and validations. Uh, now, the way it is, as it is, um, sometimes we're missing some important steps. That's because this is still new to us. And I can give example on, like, um, on our work in learning. Uh, obviously, we also incorporated the AI uh, component into um, our learning experiences, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. in self-paced courses. And uh, we're hoping at some point to unload our uh, uh, real like subject matter experts, right, who check assignments and so on. We're doing this on a low, so-called low uh, level, re low risk uh, risk courses. We realize uh -huh. that uh, if AI does something wrong, gives. Uh, bad feedback and so on and our risks are low we're not incorporating ai into like higher risk courses more like technical and heavy stuff so the to summarize what i'm trying to say is lots of steps are missing data validation is obviously a crucial step it's absent in um i think in many cases uh we will have those policies and guides and hopefully in a proactive way, not reactive way. Oh, thank you for sharing, yes. Um, and um, let's move to, to the next question. I know that we have some just limits in time also. My next question is, uh, you know, more uh, from this perspective of uh, us humans in the age of co-pilots and uh, gen AI tools. And... Um, how is uh, the role of humans evolving in business processes with uh, the advent of co-pilots for developers and gen AI tools for various specializations? How can we, you know, just live together with them right now? Um, who, who wants to contribute here? So Our can... life right now. Uh, yeah, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, go uh, we have uh, our standard processes and we have a lot of different and new co-pilots and new AI tools are appearing. How we can integrate them uh, in an optimal way and uh, just with the goal, you know, to achieve some good outcomes, good results that we, we want to achieve, maybe some new results, maybe not new results maybe uh some with some other goals uh, can you comment here i mean i think we 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 are all hesitant to use new technology until suddenly it strikes us that we found that new feature in excel or we found that new feature somewhere that made our life easier and i i think in in the companies that are leading the way, there has to be change agents out there that are coaching people to start using these technologies to show them how it will make their lives easier, how a co-pilot uh, will enable them to be more efficient in their jobs or have more fun at work. And so I think it's, it's going to require, uh, again, change, change agents out there that are working in their organizations to suggest uh, to people that hey this this is going to improve this is going to improve your life and uh, so so give it a give it a try I think we all experienced that with ChatGPT the first few times we used it just to check it out and then something struck us in the business world and said you know I I could use this right now to we were using a traditional Google search instead of going to ChatGPT um, I think uh, you know these these change agents will help us to to you know, to move to move to the future of AI when we're not really thinking about that in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I, I can add to that. First of all, I want to th thank you for the word evolving. So humans okay. are evolving. We're not disappearing. We're not threatened, <laughs> right? We're evolving together with the technology. And I always think about the industrial revolution, right? So um, I'm sure those people back then were also stressed and worried when uh, they started using machines heavily, uh, when machines could you, you know, do so many tasks uh, quicker and many more than a human being could. But we're still here, right? We're evolving yeah. together with these technologies. They help us evolve as humankind and we will i truly believe we will always be in the center of this development technological and this uh, mm -hmm. technical revolutions yes we will need to reskill we have discussed this a little bit right so we will mm -hmm. just like those people back then they had to uh reskill to learn something new how to operate those machines and that's how performance of uh, the companies and everybody enhanced. I think what's happening right now is exactly the same as strange as it may sound, right? So we're just, we have something totally new uh, technologically. We're learning to get out of it as much as we can by developing our skills and developing ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your opinions. Uh, my personal opinion is just when I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, about some process inside a company, just any company. So uh, I'm thinking about the, the, the role of uh, AI here. And when I start, uh, just start thinking about it, I, I personally, for me, it's... Uh, very essential just to define you know these boundaries okay the ai you will do this helping me with some routine operations all the decision making all the creative process some strategical planning will be on me not on the ai and uh, i think this is the, the the most important thing here that we have to understand how all these co-pilots and uh, assistants and other tools, how they will help us, or just me, to make my work, uh, in fact, not more efficient. I don't like this word. Uh, I like, uh, uh, you know, just I have everybody has a lot of routine tasks. And in fact, we hate this routine. So my vision is that in any business process, if this co-pilot or generative AI could take this part of my job and, and make it better, means faster and uh, deeper, uh, providing just more insights for me to take some decisions, uh, I will be happy. And uh, the question here is, uh, are we ready you know, just to build, to change all these processes. Because right now we have, you know, communications. We like to communicate in chats and uh, uh, writing some uh, reviews, some summaries by ourselves because we like it and we hate it at the same time because it, it's uh, part of our time. Yeah, then sending and just discussing it with our colleagues. But maybe these co-pilots and generative AI absolutely could replace this part. And the next question is, what will be, just to, to all of us, uh, what is, will be the real place of, of uh, human inside of any process, processes? Maybe in three, five years. Imagine, let, let's start to think that a lot of different co-pilots will appear in our lives. And that's, I think that's, that's true, yeah? that it will happen. How can our jobs will be, will be changed with that? Will they, it was that question, will they replace completely or take something from our routine tasks and, and then what we will do? Why I'm asking this? Because uh, I had 
I asked also uh, my QAs and my team's uh, uh, BAs also, okay, you have this copilots, you, 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 you have tried them. Does it mean that when you start using that, you will write more code? Or does it mean that you will write more, uh, uh, the, the quality of your code will be better? Or what? What, what the, the outcome will be there? Yeah, and they said, okay, we don't know. We can, yeah, we really, we don't know. We are trying right now. Uh, maybe it's, it will be more court. Maybe it will be no, quality, no, nobody named quality, you know, because uh, they think that, okay, so the ideas and the, the human, they can pro produce uh, better code. But what... What will be the human role inside this environment? Can you share maybe some of your ideas here? Maybe I want to add because uh, this week I had a strange situation, a really funny situation because I, in data art we decided to mm -hmm. maybe de de um, uh, to decide which uh, maybe some AI model or Gen AI mm -hmm. model we can use in our staffing system. Andre, you have experience mm -hmm. to work with the staffing system, and I decided to share this idea with my colleagues who directly work, work with the system. And the mm -hmm. first question that I receive: Are you planning to replace all of us? Because people are really scaring. We yeah. now we are talking. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we hear some excitement that we have such great tool, but on the other hand, we feel some. We know some fears of uh, of people regarding it. I can say that mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine uh, uh, that we can replace people, but uh, and human. But I think that crucial role is decision making, where we can uh, implement and where we can use in which part of process general AI models. It's really important. After that, we need to uh, work with technical specialists to describe this need and to have this level of understanding um, how Jen and I could help us. And as we mentioned previously, to how to, to show our collaborative and uh, teamwork. Uh, after that, we need to train this model, and after that, we can use it. But on the other hand, we still need to provide feedback, and we have never ending process of improvement because, as we mentioned, that technology is changing, now the uh, world is changing, and potentially we need to change all our system, all our models that we are actively using, all our processes. And due to that, I totally hope that human will be decision maker and will be the leader of these processes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Re revealed. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, and I think uh, a good, Tatiana brought up a good example in, in work lives and in, in my work lives, certainly dealing with clients, there is a there's a there's a whole lot of time that we spend putting PowerPoints together and putting the appropriate slides together. That is uh, it's a relatively mundane task that I'm sure within the next three to five years, we're going to be able to tell AI to, to put together a certain presentation and with a certain client references in it that um that we'll be able to present and we'll, it will certainly minimize the amount of time we have to, we, we take today to do that. Now, what that does, it, it enables us to do things that are more important, which are understanding our clients better or doing the research on clients better mm -hmm. or uh, ideating on what is the best solution. I, I, I think what we really get a, a job satisfaction out of is the creative aspects of that. Uh, versus these these tasks that uh, AI and generative AI is is certainly uh, well tuned to doing. So I think that uh, you know we'll, we'll certainly be uh, uh, it'll enable us to have more time, whether that's less time working, uh, which we probably all need, or more time researching our, our customers or understanding our colleagues 
and uh, the positions that they're coming from, I think uh, it will better us all. Yeah, uh, we have to find this, you know, balance between technology and 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 human in in all the in all the business processes we have in in, in companies. Yeah, so it's uh, absolutely absolutely understandable that we will and a lot of uh, a lot of businesses will implement AI in their business processes, but uh, uh, but let's think what tasks are we uh, delegating to this AI, not all the tasks. Otherwise, we will live, uh, you know, in, in the world uh, of Skynet. Uh, one AI is uh, conducting the meeting, another AI, you know, just generating some summary, uh, another tool or, or co-pilot sending this to another co-pilot uh, he is uh, reviewing this answering to the uh, to the questions uh, planning the work and uh, defining also to another uh, AI uh, who is able to generate the code you know what the code should be written and uh, where the human is inside this process so uh, this is uh, <coughs> A picture from sci-fi movies, you know, but uh, we have to think about this right now. Boundaries and uh, tasks that we uh, delegate to this AI. Okay, we are moving to, to the last section and uh, it's more, uh, this section is more about, you know, desirable candidates uh, we want to have in, uh, in our companies and uh, the question just maybe very very simple what approach proves to be more economically beneficial for companies seeking a superhero with both ai and subject matter expertise in a single individual or cultivating such expertise within the company through teamwork evolution learning and so on who who want to to answer to this question again i think you know i think in the leadership roles especially in some of these newer departments it's sometimes very difficult to to develop that expertise because it takes a lot of time our chief innovation officer yuri gubin used the term the other day finding the unicorn uh for these leadership roles where um you need someone who has this unique unicorn-like set of skills to lead a project mm -hmm. that has come up perhaps rather quickly in a competitive industry that you need to maintain, you know, your your competitive uh, your competitive stance out there, or else you you can lose some some revenue perhaps. So while there's this need there there's this need for these unicorns certainly in these leadership and high-paying positions. Um, I certainly developing this expertise when you have the time to do that is the more economical approach, assuming you do, you do have that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Tatiana, do you have something to add to? Yes, I think said? that it's necessary uh, taking into account the goal of the company and the division. Do we have enough time? or we just want to have a quick result and st have strict deadline that we need to finish the project. And also, do we have enough budget to move to the competitive market with really limited talent pool and have this competition with uh, uh, different um, uh, companies? And also, it's necessary check to stack because it's uh, really um, important to check, do we have such resources inside in company or on the market because we can spend a long time period to looking for some uh, superhero or unicorn and cannot find it it's really have this alignment between requirements I, I i know about this pain in case if you receive really hard uh requirements that uh, uh, really difficult to combine in one person and uh, due to that i can say in case if you have superhero, you could have really quick 
uh, and immediate impact on your project because this person could be a fast decision maker. You uh, decrease your time of some onboarding or additional learning, conditional trainings, and also. Um, but on the other hand, we need to keep in mind that. Uh, we have a limited amount of such people and uh, do we have enough time just to spend for searching in case if we want to cultivate this um, uh, educational process for whole team i think that this way is really sustainable we need to spend maybe more time to spend some resources to find trainers mentors to prepare this program but on the other hand as a result we will have some teamwork uh, I think we can boost uh, creativity collaboration uh, between colleagues who can meet and maybe work together like technical uh, experts and domain uh, domain experts and in, in a case, if you're talking about some sustainable approach, I think we should find balance because it's important to have a superheroes and it's important to boost general uh, knowledge about how Gen AI can help us, everyone in our daily routine for whole company. And But it depends on the strategy which can choose each company. Yeah. George. If you ask me what I prefer more, uh, to work with superhero or with... Uh, uh, okay, uh, do I like to, li uh, to work with superheroes as a delivery manager? Uh, my answer would be I prefer to work with uh, dream teams. And uh, not only one person, one superhero is able right now in the modern in the modern world and uh, solving complex really real complex problems uh one superhero is not able to solve everything so my you know just this sweetest dream is that i can hire the team of two three four people working together some domain experts, subject matter experts, some uh, data scientists, just I'm thinking about projects for AI ML, uh, some uh, team leader with uh, project management skills able to work efficiently with uh, all these uh, generative AI and co-pilots and, uh, and just another roles, yeah? So superhero, he is, limited in abilities also my choice would be a dream team of superhero juniors uh, co-pilots uh, subject matter experts and uh, you know we together we can solve uh, a lot of new problems that will appear in our, just uh, uh, in our uh, clients' environments right now. Um, time is running uh, out, and uh, maybe just the last question uh, for Marina and all of us. How can companies adapt to the evolving skill requirements in the AI era? Well, um, I think this is a twofold question. Uh, are we talking about uh, AI skill requirements or just quickly changing skill, skill requirements? Because this, uh, quickly, the response may yeah. be the same, but yeah, it's just like two perspectives. In terms of AI uh, skills, uh, I can tell that this is obviously happening right now very quickly in IT companies. Uh, I was at a huge uh, talent development conference in May and uh, I talked to, there were like thousands of participants there and it was May and I was surprised that um, quite a lot of companies, many um, participants from non-IT industries, uh, they didn't try chat GTP, they didn't really aim to do anything about that. And I realized that um, IT industries, IT companies are obviously front runners because 
sure. in May, uh, lots of companies had chat GTPs already installed into their learning platforms, right? Different types of trainings, uh, experimenting how developers code with chat G GTP without it, developing training programs already. That's what we're doing now at Data Arts as well, right? We're like, we're, we launched already and uh, prompting AI uh, program. Uh, so this is happening right now. Obviously, uh, all IT, I'm sure like 100% of IT companies plan to, uh, if they haven't done so yet, which I doubt, plan to incorporate AI uh, skills training and big data into their training strategies, obviously. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically this is about um, AI skills. In terms of, in general, quickly changing skills, uh, referring back to uh, the numbers that I shared about the quite uh, short lifespans of digital skills, especially, um, I don't think there is any, um, you know, um, secret about that. It's developing learning culture in, in the company, promoting, supporting it. Learning culture means when uh, employees uh, seek to gain new knowledge and skills, um, apply new knowledge and skills, and share new knowledge and skills. That's what learning culture is about. Uh, if we want our employees to adapt, adjust, acquire new skills, we should promote that. It starts with leadership, obviously, who act as role models who uh, act as mentors in first mentoring programs, for instance, uh, who promote this at various events and so on, even via emails encouraging everyone to participate in a certain program. Uh, it's uh, internal programs, obviously, on reskilling and upskilling. That's what many companies do. Uh, in this case, it's super important when talent development teams uh, cooperate, work like hand in hand with delivery teams, right? With capability centers, with professional communities inside the company. Uh, leverage the power of AI, obviously, that's what we're doing, right? This uh, using AI uh, shortens considerably the content production time, uh, facilitates delivery of certain learning courses launch internships, uh, partner with universities, let's invest more and think globally, right? Uh, it's great to have internships and internal reskilling, and upskilling programs inside the company. But when you're a company of certain size, you already realize that you need to contribute to the society and to make your solutions more sustainable. And that's when we start talking to universities, right? And launching uh, new mm. programs. So zillions of ways, yes. Thank you, Marina. Tatiana, Greg, do you want to add something here? Maybe you also just uh, can share some piece of advice for our listeners because that was a last question and we have to finalize our panel discussion. Yeah, sure. I, I, I was fortunate to start my career at IBM in the uh, in the mainframe era, and I was calling <laughs> on CIOs back then when I was 24 years old. And you know, certainly that was a, a, a learning environment. And throughout my career, one of the things I've seen in the, in, our, in the IT industry is change has been constant, and the best companies out there embrace change. Uh, as so, sort of a, a permanent endeavor. I think what we're seeing with AI and certainly the release of ChatGPT opening up everyone's eyes is that pace of change or the importance of uptaking AI uh, is, is becoming more and more important and maybe more rapid than some of the other changes out there. But I think the best CIOs of the world who certainly we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis here at Data Art are really thinking about this full time in terms of how to how to AI enable their organizations, and so it, it it will continue as it has in the past in terms of uh, you know driving change in their organization, creating the uh, the business cases to their CEOs as to why they're they're budgeting for these types of projects, and and then making those projects efficient, whether it's hiring their people externally, training them 
we're coming to organizations like Data Art, which specialize in, in certainly maintaining these skills uh, so our, our clients can use them as needed over, over uh, time and as they, as they build out their, their capabilities. Thank you. Uh, Tatiana? Uh, what can I add? Colleagues share a lot of uh, really nice thoughts regarding what we can do, but uh, summarizing maybe all information that we discuss, I can say that uh, it's really important for everyone never stop learning process, to be open for new opportunities, and also uh, Gen AI can provide such opportunity for us. And uh, in case if we're talking about companies, it's important to think about strong AI team and how to boost in general um, a general knowledge of our colleagues, how Gen AI can help them and be open for these suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, colleagues. We, we have to finish right now. And uh, I would like to meet you, you know, just in, in one year, in maybe in two years. And uh, we will have this recording and maybe the same questions and see the difference. Uh, I really want it because I, I hope that the world will be changing in the way that we are not able to predict right now. And that's extremely, extremely interesting for me. And yeah, this ability to learn fast, ability to ask questions, a bit of curiosity and uh, flexibility and adaptability to the changing world. I, I think this is the fundamental right now, just to, to live and to, uh, to produce some results in any uh, job that we have. IT, design, uh, marketing, sales, and so on. Let's, uh, how to say, let's try all of this new technologies. Let's think about how all this Gen AI and co-pilots can help us to be more productive, maybe to free up some time for personal things and, uh, and maybe just to uh, provide new data, new information for new decisions, for new creative processes that we as a human beings are able to uh, you know, to we are able for uh, to to make this creative process, creative thinking, to um, to build something new. I hope that AI is not able to do it, but let's check it uh, in one year. Thank you, thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank, thank you, dear you. listeners. Yeah, uh, that was data art IT nonstop. Uh, see, see you. Bye, bye.